The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Welcome back to our study of the book of Colossians. In our last session, we began looking at Colossians chapter 3. And as we looked at chapter 3, we saw in the beginning portion of that chapter, we're exhorted to set our affections on things above. In other words, Paul was saying, look up, look up into the heavens and see and appreciate what is there. And then as we dropped on down to verse 5, we had a series of what we called put-offs. In other words, Paul was telling the brethren at Colossae and us through the keeping of this book to put off certain things that aren't compatible with our Christian walk. But then we also saw as we dropped on down that we are to put on certain things. When we get to verse 12, for instance, it says to put on the tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. And we talked about each one of those components last in our last session. The concept of tender mercies. Paul is talking about having a heart of compassion. If there's one thing that we all need is mercy from God and from His grace. Kindness has the idea of being gentle, one with another. And Paul is exhorting us to put that on. He also talks about humility, not being proud, not being haughty, not thinking highly of oneself. We are to have good self-respect, but we get our self-respect because of Christ who dwells in us, not because of us ourselves. And then we're exhorted to put on meekness there in verse 12, which is the quality of being gentle and submissive. We're told in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, for instance, that Moses was a very meek man. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Christ is considered to be meek. Long-suffering and patience, these are characteristics of someone who does not lose their patience with others. And I think we would all have to agree, we all have at times a need to work on that. But now we'll begin with verse 13 of Colossians chapter 3 and continue on with our study. The scripture there reads, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. The concept of forgiveness is so pivotal to the Christian walk. There are really two kinds of forgiveness. There's what we might call vertical forgiveness. This is where God has to forgive us if we come to him, and he said he would if we come to him in repentance and confession. But there's also horizontal forgiveness, and this is where we have to sometimes forgive one another. And in this particular passage, he's probably talking about that when he says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. But then he ties it to vertical forgiveness because he says, we're to do with one another in terms of forgiveness the way Christ does with us. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, we have a very similar thought that Paul wrote to the Ephesians about forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 6, where we have what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, Jesus puts a real emphasis on forgiveness. If we look at that prayer in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 6, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus is saying part of our appropriate prayer is to ask God to forgive us as we are willing to forgive others. And then when we drop down to verse 14, after the close of that prayer, Jesus makes a comment on this concept of forgiveness where it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He clearly places there and also in Matthew chapter 18 in a particular parable in the latter few verses of that verse he ties this same thought that God is going to forgive us to the extent we're willing to extend forgiveness to others. Therefore our forgiveness of one another is extremely important. 
We have to have God's forgiveness in order to be saved, but God says that we need to be willing to extend forgiveness to others, even if they don't ask for it, because that's the Christian thing to do, and it is for our own good. If we harbor grudges and are not forgiving to others, even when they fail to ask for it, we're placing an anvil around us that makes it hard for us to do the Christian walk when we have this kind of an attitude. And Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them. And they hadn't asked for forgiveness. We find Stephen in the book of Acts as he was being stoned, also saying, asking that they be forgiven, even though they hadn't asked for it. Certainly it's appropriate when it's needed that people ask for forgiveness of one another and we ask for forgiveness of one another, but we are to forgive anyway because our salvation is tied to our forgiveness of others. So when Paul says here in Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 that we are to bear with one another and forgive one another, we're to be tolerant, we're to forgive. Now, we can't forgive sins. We can just forgive offenses against us. God has to do the forgiving of sins. And it says, if anyone has a complaint against another, the word there used for complaint is the Greek word momphi. And it occurs nowhere else in the New Testament, but it means fault found, blame, or censure. But there are other passages that tell us that we should not uh, complain and grumble. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 2 when he says that we should not do these things. Christians bear and forgive, and he does so because a forgiven man must also be forgiving. And as God forgave him, he must also forgive others. It's just incongruent to withhold forgiveness of others and then expect God to lavish his forgiveness on us. And certainly Christ is our example. We are treat we are to treat others and forgive others as God and Christ have treated us and forgiven us. A Christian has the spirit of patience with the faults of others. Sometimes we are so willing to overlook our own faults and so eager to jump on the faults of others. We all need to understand that we need one another's forbearing and forgiveness. And we should be willing to follow the example that Christ has given us. Now we'll look at verse 14. But above, all, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. This is the concept of expressing agape love. Wilbur Fields paraphrased verse 14 as follows. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond that holds all things in a state of perfecting or completeness. Love is the thing that holds the body of Christ together. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, as you love one another. And the word here for love is agape, and it's a love motivated by a genuine welfare in another. We are to want what is best for others, even when they are not loving toward us. That's why Jesus was able to say, in Matthew chapter 5 and Paul in Romans chapter 12, that we should love our enemies. That doesn't mean we are always going to like them. It doesn't mean that we're certainly going to like what they do, but we should always want what is best for them. Well, what is always the best for everybody? It's to have the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives and have our sins washed away. So we are to share the gospel. We are to want that for everyone, irregardless of how they they treat us. And Paul says this is the bond of perfectness or the bond of completeness. It's the bond of all perfection. It's the thing which will unite all other things and make them complete, even when the going seems a little bit hard. Paul writing in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And certainly having love within the brotherhood and love amongst men is the way to have peace. The tendency of any body of people is probably to fly apart sooner or later, as Wilbur Fields points out. But a bond is something which binds or ties together those individuals. 
Love is the bond which binds the church together in this complete unity that Paul is talking about. Love will bind all the other virtues together and render God's whole system complete. So Paul is urging the Colossians and those in Laodicea and Hierapolis that undoubtedly read this letter and you and I who today are reading this letter to put on love. Let that be our garment. Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. In the very few first verses of this book, Paul talks about grace and peace. And we talked about that in our early sessions. But the peace of God, we need to notice, first of all, this is not the peace from God. It's the peace of God. Now, this peace does come from God. But I think it's even more than just God being a referee. This is the, the calmness. This is the assurance that God himself has because of his perfection that we can join in. Maybe that's why Paul in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 talked about the peace which passes all understanding. Well, I think what Paul is saying is the peace of God, it, it goes beyond human wisdom and human understanding. It's a divine capacity. It's something that we can enjoy. It's something that we can have, even though we may not be able to fully understand it because of its divine nature. Let the peace which Christ gives rule in your hearts. This is the concept that we have here. Let it make the decisions. Approach life with the peace that God has and that we are called to God and be thankful. Many times Paul reminds the reader to be thankful and what should we be more thankful for than having the love and the peace of God. Because the peace of God is what calms the mind calms the heart. It allows us to have joy when our circumstances maybe aren't joyous. To rule has the concept of to arbitrate or to govern. It comes from the Greek word brabio. And Paul uses the verb that's taken from an athletic arena. It's the word used by an umpire to settle things in a matter of disputes. It's the idea that this peace ruling in our hearts can settle discouragements. It can settle stress. It can settle worry because if we cast our cares upon him, he certainly does care for us. And certainly whether it's within us or amongst brethren or amongst any group of people, no good progress can be made while fighting is going on. Progress is made when there is peace. And for that peace, Paul says, we are to be thankful. Now we move to verse 16, which introduces a really interesting concept of our worship. The concept of our singing and making melody in our hearts. Let me read verse 16 for you. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Probably few verses have been more talked about and more discussed than this particular passage. But I think it's a wonderfully encouraging passage, and it's a parallel passage to what Paul wrote to the Ephesian brethren in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, where he said in almost identical words, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The parallel between these two passages is quite striking, and Paul undoubtedly felt this was a very important series of thoughts for us to consider. First of all, I want to look at the concept of teaching and admonishing one another. I think this transcends even our, the music that's talked about in this verse. It shows the edification is to be of one another, not of a select few. Oftentimes in the religious world, we hear a distinction between clergy and laity. I don't find that distinction in Scripture. We are all to minister as we have the talents and the abilities to do it. And as the men of a congregation are capable of, 
and willing to exhort and to edify and to teach, they should use that talent and be given that opportunity. I believe in the early church that those who proclaimed the word of God often probably had dirt-stained hands because they made their living by the toil of the ground or by fishing or by carpentry. They were calloused hands because God honors work. There was not this distinction of a certain class and only a certain class that is to teach and exhort. No, that is determined by one's ability and we are all to be of that. I am not against the terms clergy and laity. I just think they are to overlap because we are all ministers unto God. The word minister in the New Testament is from the Greek word diakonos. It means an attendant, someone who would wait on the table or minister and be a servant. And certainly we are all in that sense to be ministers as the New Testament uses that term. We all are to serve one another as we minister functionally one to another, but not in an elevated elite office to be filled with truth so that they could elevate the mind. Then we come into a series of words in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And there's been much debate and discussion and, and thought as to what these are and what their differences are. I don't know that we can fully know the differences of them, but it's probably sufficient for us to know that these were songs of various origins that the early church, and therefore we, can use to praise and glorify God. Psalms probably refers to the psalms that we see in the book of Psalms, and they were often set to music or to a melody, and they may well have sung some of the psalms in that way, and some of you in your various congregations may have sung some of those psalms as Someone has put music to them. Hymns has the concept of being a religious ode, a poem, shall we say, put to music. Spiritual songs comes from the Greek word pneumatikos, and it has to do with a song of the spirit, an ode or a chant. So when we put all of these together, these are expressions of praise and religious admiration and a spiritual manifestation in song. Our music, therefore, with the previous phrases, is to teach and admonish. It's the words and the thoughts of our music that is to be the predominant thing that we do look at, not just an appeal to our emotions. Now, music does generate emotion, and I don't know that that is always bad, but emotion is not to be the primary part of it. It's the words of praise and glory that come from these songs to the Lord. And certainly, our music is not to be focused primarily on man's desires or preferences. Whether or not you or I think a particular song has a pretty melody is really not relevant to God. God's listening to the words. And we all have different tastes in terms of what is a pretty melody or a pretty harmony. I believe the first century church, without question, according to scriptures, was a singing church. It was reported by various historians that the Jews, as they assembled, would often spend the whole night in song. And we also see in the New Testament that the early church did not use instruments to accompany. Both scripture and history indicates that instruments accompanying these songs in the worship service did not occur for several centuries later. This passage says we are to sing from the heart. And since the early church did not use instruments in their singing and in their worship, it's very apparent to me that that was pleasing unto the Lord. Many times Paul and the inspired writers would have to correct the church when it was going in a direction that wasn't pleasing to God. But not once do any of the inspired writers or the canonized scriptures have any reproof of them not using instruments, which says God was pleased with that. Paul was never bashful pointing out a difficulty that the church was having. He was in a loving way, but also in a very firm way, often pointed out difficulties they were having with the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians or various aspects of their worship. 
But never once was the church condemned for not using instrumental musics. It wasn't until, as I said, centuries later that man kind of thought this would help. This would make it more pleasing. Well, to some it might make it more pleasing to their ears, but we need to remember that our music is for the ears of God, not necessarily for our ears. Some arguments have occurred over the word solos from Psalms to the effect that it play, refers to a playing of a harp. And that is an indication of using of an instrument. But when we look at this, we see in this passage, this plucking has nothing to do with an instrument. It is the plucking of the human heart. So speaking in songs, they are to teach and admonish one another by bringing the thoughts and feelings of the heart into harmony with the words and the sentiment of the songs. Singing with grace unto your hearts to the Lord. Those people who were most keenly aware of the grace of God and what it has done in their lives are going to be the people that are most joyous and more apt to sing. You ever been someone around someone that just has a song in their heart? They, they can hear it. I, I've uh, been told and observed that you can tell when people are happy when they are singing. My mother constantly would be singing. And when you're singing and humming, especially spiritual songs, that's a very good indication of your contentment. There is a danger when our song service, or should our song service, ever be diverted into a musical performance to entertain man instead of to praise God. Such worship diverts the mind from instead of aiding in our admonition. The melody of the lips is the filling of the heart. In a parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, Paul wrote that we are to be filled with the Spirit, speaking one to another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. And that's what a person who is filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God, is going to do. Now let's look at verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This carries the idea of respecting the authority of the Lord Jesus in everything. This verse maybe is the apex of dedication to Christ. You remember that when we began this study, we said that the overriding theme of Colossians was the preeminence of Christ. Well, this idea of doing all in the name of the Lord is certainly an admission of his preeminence and our commitment and dedication to him. Now, when it says do all in the name of the Lord, I believe it's talking about doing all things according to his authority, his love, his deity, his grace. Do everything in the name of Christ. When we end our prayers, we typically say, in the name of Jesus Christ. What are we doing when we end a prayer like that? Are we addressing the envelope as if the Lord didn't know the prayer was directed to him? No, we are saying, we offer this prayer according to your authority. And we are submitting to your authority as we humbly petition you in this prayer. Albert Barnes on this passage wrote, and I quote, do it all, do all things, because he requires and commands it, and with a desire to honor him, his authority should be the warrant, his glory the aim of all our actions and our words. One of the best tests of any action is, can we do it calling upon the name of the Lord? Can we do it asking for his help? When we engage in an activity, would it be appropriate to ask the Lord to help us in that activity? Or is it an activity that we'd be ashamed to ask his help? Well, I think that's a very good test and a very good way for us to approach it. One of the best tests of any word is can we speak it and in the same breath name, it, name the name of Jesus? This was one of the points that William Barclay again made in his approach to this particular passage. Can we speak it, remembering that he will hear it, because he hears all that we say? If a man brings every word and deed to the test of the presence of Jesus Christ, 
He will not go wrong. If we approach everything we do is, would we feel good if Christ was right here with us, partaking of this particular activity, going with us wherever we went? That is certainly a, a test for us to do. Now before we move into verses 18, I just wanted to kind of look at this particular put off and put on things that Paul has given us. But we're told in the fifth verse of this chapter to put off fornication, uncleanness, passion, and we're to put on compassion, kindness, lowliness in verses 12 and following. We take that further, we're to put off evil desire and put on meekness. We're to put off covetousness and put on long-suffering. We're to put off anger and we're to put on forbearance. We're to put off wrath. We're to put on forgiveness. We're to put off malice. We're to put on love. We're to put off railing or complaining and put on the peace of Christ. We're to put off shameful speaking replace it with thankfulness, to put off lies and replace it with the word of Christ, to put off racial or social prejudice, as we see in verse 11, and put on dedication to Christ, as we saw in verse 17. So this putting off of these things and putting on is quite a transformational thing for a Christian. And we all certainly have our work cut out for us as we do these things, but this is the direction that Paul and the Holy Spirit are giving the brethren at Colossae, and it's the direction I believe he is giving us. With that now, we will turn now to verses 18 through 21, and we're beginning a section here that I call family or reciprocal relationships, because we're going to be looking at the husband-wife relationship. Paul's going to take us to look at the parent-child relationship, and he's going to take us to look at the master-slave, or today we might say employer-employee relationship. So with that, let me read for you those, those verses, 18 through 21, and then we will go back and make some comments on them. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now certainly, those very concise passages here in Colossians follow very much what Paul said in his writing to the Ephesians, when in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, to chapter 6, verse 4, he carried many of these same thoughts. He did flesh out or, or embellish these thoughts a little more fully in the book of Ephesians. So I would encourage you in your studies to look at the latter part of the fifth chapter of Ephesians and the first part of the sixth chapter. But we'll deal with it here as Paul has given it to us in Colossians. God gave the family and God considers the family to be extremely important. God has given us three institutions to guide us. He has given us the home to protect the family. He has given us our civil government to protect our lives. And he has given us the church to protect our souls. But which one of those did he give to us first? Well, we don't go any further than Genesis chapter 2 to see that it was the family. Not that the family is necessarily more important than these others, but the other two, our governments and, our, and the church, are so built upon the family. Civil governments will not be able to perform as God would like for them to do if we do not have strong families. The church is not going to be able to perform as God would like for it to if we do not have strong families. One of the very definite aspects of leadership in the church, elders and deacons, is the concept of good marriages and ruling one's home well. And this becomes very, very important, not only to the church in the first century, but it becomes very important to us. In Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 28, 
Jesus makes an interesting comment that probably wasn't specifically directed toward marriage, but I think it's applicable. He said there in verse 28 through 32, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not set down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation, he is not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not set down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. In both of these illustrations that Jesus is giving us here in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 14, he's telling us that we need to prepare for whatever activity we engage in. And what would be more important, what would be more paramount than preparing to be a husband or preparing to be a wife or preparing to start a family? And yet we see time and time again today that people often enter this with little preparation, with maybe not the thought that it deserves. And the family and the home doesn't prosper as God wants it to prosper. Paul talks about the wife respecting, submitting to her husband in Ephesians chapter 5, as well as in this passage here in Colossians. And in Ephesians 5, he also tells the husband to love his wife as Christ, he says there in Ephesians, loved the church. Well, how did Christ love the church? He loved the church so much that he sacrificed his own life. A husband who loves his wife like that will sacrifice anything, including himself if necessary, to protect her and to keep her well. In Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 and 4, the writer there says, Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. In those two verses there are two sets of triplets. The first set is wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And the second set is built, established, and filled. And I'd like to look at those for just a moment before we specifically look at this passage in Colossians because it is so crucial to how a family, a Christian family, a Christian home is to be developed. He says, first of all, that we are to look at it in terms of wisdom. Wisdom there comes from the Hebrew word hakama, and it means to be skillful, wise, even to have a, a wit or maybe a, a sense of humor about it. And that is what it, the home is to be built on. Built there is from the Hebrew word bana, B-A-N-A. And it means to make repair, to set up. In other words, wisdom is what is going to set up and build the home. There also has to be understanding from the Hebrew word taboon. It means to use discretion, reason skillfulness in our application of wisdom and that will establish the home. The word established there from the Hebrew kun means to properly erect it, to set it and on a sure fitting. And then we're to use knowledge from the Hebrew word data, D-A-T-A, D-A-A-T, pardon me, to be wise and, and, and cunning and that's the home, is, the home is to be filled with that. It is to be consecrated. It is to be protected. It is to be put at peace. So the writer there in Proverbs is telling us that to build our homes and our relationships that we're going to be looking at very shortly here in, in, in Colossians, we need to have wisdom, understanding, and knowledge that goes beyond the surface. What parent hasn't had a child come in and ask the child, how was your day? And the child will say, fine. And then they, they go to their room. But a discerning parent can understand whether that really means fine or whether there needs to be more investigation in dealing with the child. The same is true in a marriage. 
The psalmist was very wise when he wrote in Psalms 127 and 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. There's a Latin phrase for that that's sometimes attached to that particular psalm. It's Nisa Dominus Frusta. And it simply means, without the Lord it is vain. And that's what the psalmist says there. That's what the Holy Spirit says. Unless the Lord builds the house. And obviously he's not talking about a physical structure. He's talking about the home. And he's talking about the family. So let's go back now to Col Colossians chapter 3. And look again now at just verses 18 and 19. In Colossians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19. It says, Wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter toward them. What we're beginning to deal here with now are these interpersonal relationships, and I think we could call them reciprocal relationships. It's a relationship in which you give, and also one in which you receive. James Kaufman, in his commentary on this, I thought had a very insightful paragraph that will close this session on and then we'll begin with this when we come back to our next session. He wrote, and I quote, This begins Paul's instructions on certain reciprocal relationships, that of wives and husbands being treated first. The glorious difference between the Christian concept of duty and that prevalent in the world of Paul's day lies in the fact that obligations, even the sacred obligations of marriage, are reciprocal obligations. The duty is never all on one side. In the Roman Empire of Paul's day, there were no recognized rights of women, children, or slaves who were all expected to obey husbands, parents, and masters upon penalty of death. But Christianity and the writings that we're looking at today change that. As observed in the parallel place in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul enunciates a great ethic of mutual respect and obligation in these sectors. And this ethic destroyed slavery and other abuses, although, of course, not immediately, end quote. I thought that was a very insightful approach to the verses we're going to be looking at. And certainly Christianity did much to the equality of individuals, the rights of individuals, but yet it was the spiritual rights of individuals that the gospel is most concerned about, the physical aspects that are appropriate, but the physical aspects are not eternal. So when we gather together next time, we'll look at these relationships that we see here in these following verses, and we will consider them as the Lord has asked us to do. We thank that you being with us and the time you have given us, and we enjoy further looking into the book of Colossians when we come back together again.